Ladies and gentlemen, I finally did it. I solved the medium difficulty Sudoku in my favorite newspaper. But do you believe me? I could convince you by showing you the solved grid, but I also don't want to reveal my hard-won knowledge. It turns out there's a very different way of convincing you that I've solved the puzzle. The cool thing is, I can do that without giving you any information about what my solution actually is. This is an instance of a so-called zero-knowledge proof, one of the most fundamental concepts in cryptography. After we construct a zero-knowledge proof for my Sudoku, we'll also touch on some more advanced stuff, like how to make these proofs for Mario speedruns, and how zero-knowledge proofs changed our understanding of the nature of trust. Before we attempt to solve this seemingly impossible problem, let me tell you a story that'll help us gain some intuition about the problem and how to approach it. Imagine you're a school teacher, and you've just explained to the pupils how to add two-digit numbers. Now you'd like to test whether the children can add properly. The simplest way to do that is to keep selecting random two-digit numbers and asking the pupils to add them up. We can think of this process as a so-called interactive proof. The teacher is trying to verify that the pupil knows how to add numbers by issuing challenges and checking the responses. Although the teacher never knows for sure that the pupil can add any two numbers, she gets progressively more and more certain with each additional challenge. To give a concrete example, let's say that this pupil can correctly add any two numbers as long as the first one is less than 90, otherwise he always messes up. Since the challenges are generated independently, the chance that the student gets all of them right will be 90% for one response, 81% for two responses, 72.9 for three, and so on, quickly shrinking to 0.0027% after 100 responses. That means that with very high probability, our teacher will find out that the pupil still hasn't mastered addition. Our zero-knowledge proof for Sudoku will work similarly to this example. It won't be a proof in the strict mathematical sense. Instead, it'll be a back and forth conversation between me and whoever is verifying my claim. They'll be issuing some challenges and I'll try to answer them. The verifier can never be certain that I can solve the Sudoku, but if I can't and I'm just pretending, there's a high chance they will catch me and they can increase their confidence by issuing more challenges. Before I show you the zero knowledge proof, let's make our life easier by replacing Sudoku with a similar but cleaner problem, graph coloring. In the graph coloring problem, we're given a graph and a number saying how many colors we can use, in this case, three. The task is to color the nodes of the graph so that no two nodes that share an edge have the same color. For example, this is a valid coloring, but if we change the color of this node, it's no longer correct because this edge becomes unhappy. The coloring problem is similar to Sudoku in the sense that saying that two nodes must have different colors is analogous to the rule that two cells in the same row must have different numbers. But graph coloring is easier to think about because we don't need to distinguish rows, columns, etc. Soon, I'll show you exactly how to convert any Sudoku to a coloring problem, but for now, let's just think about graph coloring. That is, we'll now try to construct a zero-knowledge proof showing that I can color this particular graph with three colors. To make it a bit more concrete, let's say the person who wants to verify my coloring is Vasek, another member of the Polylog team. He wants evidence that I found a valid coloring and I don't want to leak any information about my treasured solution. But is there anything at all I can reveal to the verifier without giving him information that would help him solve the problem himself? It turns out that there is. Let's say that I hide all the colors in my solution except for these two, and I only show the verifier these two colors. Has the verifier learned anything useful about my solution? Well, intuitively, not really. Yes, he now knows that these two nodes have different colors, but that's the case in any correct solution anyway. And whether I used red and blue or some other two colors is intuitively also irrelevant since the colors are interchangeable. What is important is that the two nodes were connected by an edge. If I told the verifier the colors of two nodes that aren't connected, I'd be giving him some potentially useful information. In this case, I revealed that my solution uses different colors for two unconnected nodes. Now the verifier can figure out that these two vertices must have the same color, information that may prove helpful if he wants to solve the coloring problem himself. In general, we might be narrowing down the space of possible solutions, which means we would be giving the verifier knowledge. Okay, let's try to use the idea of revealing an edge to build a zero-knowledge proof. Here's what we do. First, I write down my solution and lock each node in a separate safe box. Once this is done, I give the locked graph to the verifier. Next, I'll let the verifier choose any of the edges of my graph. So, Vashek, which edge do you want to look at? Hmm, 
Let's see this one. Now I reveal the colors of its two nodes. But importantly, I won't reveal anything else. Okay, and as the final step, I check that the two colors are different. Which they are, so all's good. And that's it. That's the end of our simple protocol. So why are we both happy? Let's start with me, the prover. Even though I don't know in advance which edge I'll have to reveal, I always only reveal one edge. Intuitively, I just tell the verifier that the two colors of the endpoints are different, but that's already implied by my solution being correct. Good. So now let's look at it from my perspective as the verifier. To understand what I can get from this protocol, let's distinguish two cases. First, if the prover solution is correct, then I know that with 100% probability I will see two different colors. But if his solution is incorrect, like in this example, then at least one of the seven edges has both of its endpoints colored with the same color. Now, I didn't specify how exactly I choose which edge to look at, but the best strategy is not to overthink it and just choose a random one. In that case, the chance that I catch the prover cheating is at least one seventh, because there are seven edges. Put differently, when I see that the two nodes have different colors, I'm getting a tiny sliver of statistical evidence that the prover can indeed color the graph. The only problem is that I want to get a lot of statistical evidence, not just a tiny bit. To solve this, let's recall the story of our teacher. Remember, if the teacher gives a pupil just one problem and the pupil solves it, she can't be sure whether the pupil can solve all the problems or just 90% of them. But that's okay. The teacher knows that if she repeats the process many times, students who don't know how to add will eventually make a mistake. I can apply the same reasoning in my case. Even if I have only a small probability of finding a mistake in one round, I can make this probability much higher by simply repeating our simple protocol over and over and over, let's say 100 times. This way, if the prover's solution is incorrect, the probability that he survives all my challenges is at most 6 sevenths to the power of 100, which is about 1 in 10 million, and that's good enough for me. So, we have a zero knowledge proof. Or do we? As a prover, I am not happy with this protocol. I mean, it's clearly not zero knowledge anymore. I agree that in the first round you don't get any useful information, but then if we repeat this a few times, you'll quickly know the whole coloring. Fortunately, there's a simple way of fixing this problem by using randomness. In particular, between rounds I'll shuffle the colors in my solution. We're not changing the solution, we're just relabeling it. So all the red nodes will still have the same color to each other in the new solution, but that color might no longer be red. Let's see how that works in action. First, the prover shuffles the colors, locks them, and sends them to the verifier. Now, even if the verifier remembers that the two colors are red and blue, the exact colors don't mean much because of the shuffling. Before the second round, the prover shuffles the colors again. The two colors that the verifier sees now can't really be combined with the original ones. The same node may have different colors in the two rounds. With this trick, I'm happy again since I'm not giving away any useful information. And Vashek remains happy since it still holds that if I try to cheat, it's very likely that he'll catch me. What you're watching now is the final zero knowledge proof in action. It's very elegant, isn't it? Okay, this was pretty subtle, so let's see one more time why both me and the verifier get what we want from the protocol. It's important to understand that both the verifier and me are using randomness, but each one for a different purpose. As a prover, I'm using randomness to hide information about my solution. In between every two rounds, I need to randomize the color. That means that after I reveal an edge, I'm not giving any useful information about my solution, the verifier simply sees two random and different colors. Now, what about me? As a verifier, I am also using randomness, but not to hide anything. I simply need to be unpredictable. Just try to think what would happen if I was looking at the edges according to some simple rule. If the prover guessed the rule I was using, he could simply put two different random colors in the right boxes and put whatever garbage in all the other ones. I would then keep seeing different colors, but it would not prove anything. 
So it's really important that when the prover decides on how to color the vertices, he has absolutely no idea which edge I'm going to challenge. And that's why I'm using randomness. Hope this makes sense. Again, both me and Vashek are using randomness in the protocol, but each one for different reasons. I need to make the answers between different rounds uncorrelated. And I need to be unpredictable. But what if we live in different places? If we don't want to rely on sending boxes and keys back and forth with the post, we'll have to implement them using software. This can be done using what cryptographers call a commitment scheme. Such a scheme has to support two operations. Commit, which corresponds to locking a color in a box and sending it to the verifier. And reveal, which is like sending the verifier a key so that he can open the box. These operations need to have properties analogous to real boxes and keys. On the one hand, I have to trust that the verifier can't look inside the box until I send him the key. On the other hand, the verifier has to trust that when he opens the box, he'll see the same color that I originally put in. Commitment schemes can be implemented using cryptographic hash functions. Let me explain the details briefly. To commit to a color of a node, I write the color down and append a bunch of random bits to it. Then I hash this and send the result to the verifier. Since it's really hard to invert a cryptographic hash function, that's sort of their whole thing, the verifier can't really do anything with the bits that he receives. In other words, it's like giving him the value locked in a box. By the way, it's really important to append those random bits, because otherwise the verifier could sort of lockpick the box by computing the hash of each color and comparing it with what I sent him. Now let's see how I reveal a committed value. To do that, I send the verifier the value, meaning the color, and the random bit. This corresponds to sending him the key. The verifier checks that the hash function really maps the input that I just gave him to what I sent him earlier. So why does the verifier trust me? If I wanted to cheat and reveal a different color than the one I committed to, I would need to find a different message with the same hash. And the whole point of cryptographic hash functions is that this is supposed to be hard, so Vashek trusts that the color I'm showing him is the one that I committed to originally. And that's how you implement a commitment scheme. With this final piece in place, we have a software implementation of a zero-knowledge proof. Basically, whenever we lock a color in our animations, this corresponds to committing it. And whenever we unlock it, we use the reveal operation. But wait a minute. We promised you a zero-knowledge proof for Sudoku, not some weird coloring problem. We'll solve this issue with a cool trick called a reduction. Basically, instead of generalizing our protocol, we'll show how to convert other problems into coloring, and then keep the protocol the same. Let's see how to do that for Sudoku. We will reduce my Sudoku to the problem of coloring a certain graph. The graph will simply have one node for each cell of the Sudoku. We'll be coloring it with nine colors, corresponding to the nine digits used in Sudoku. And here's how we express Sudoku rules as edges. Let's focus on the first cell. One of the rules is that its number must be different from all the other cells in the same row. Let's encode this with an edge to the relevant nodes. We can do the same for all the nodes in the same column and also the remaining nodes in its 3x3 block. Of course, we have to add similar constraints for other cells in my Sudoku, but let's not show that now to avoid clutter. Finally, every Sudoku starts with some boxes containing clues, like this one. We have to encode those clues in our graph too. Specifically, we need to be able to say that a certain vertex should have a given color. This is more difficult than it seems because adding edges forces colors to be different and not the same. We'll solve this by adding a click of nine special nodes to our graph, each corresponding to one digit. We'll force the clue node to have a particular color by connecting it to all click nodes except one, which only leaves one option. Again, you do this for all clues. And this is what the graph looks like when we include all the row constraints, column constraints, and block constraints. Coloring the graph on the right now encodes the problem of solving the Sudoku on the left. And with that, we're finished. If I now want to prove to Vashek that I solved my Sudoku, I'll simply prove to him that I can color this graph. This was an example of a so-called reduction, from Sudoku to graph coloring. Could we do this trick for other problems as well? In other words, for which problems do we now have a zero-knowledge proof by converting them to the coloring problem? The short answer is that actually almost anything can be reduced to coloring. This is closely related to the topic of reductions and NP-completeness that we covered in our previous video. I'll try to explain these topics briefly with an example. So let's say you've broken the world record in speedrunning some game like Mario. 
We're talking tool-assisted speedruns here, so what you found is a certain sequence of inputs that make you beat the game at a time that's faster than anyone has ever seen. As in the Sudoku problem, you'd like to convince the world that you've broken the record, but you don't want to reveal the tricks you used in your solution. And you can actually do this by constructing a gigantic graph with this bonkers property. Being able to color the graph with three colors is equivalent to being able to break the current Mario record. Constructing this graph consists of several complicated steps that we don't have the time to cover properly, but in a nutshell, you start by implementing an algorithm that verifies proposed solutions to Mario. This algorithm is like an emulator. It simulates what happens in the game when you input a given sequence of press buttons, and after it's done, it checks whether the current world record has been broken. Beating the current world record is equivalent to knowing an input for which this algorithm outputs yes. Now, bear with me. Once you have this algorithm, you can convert it to a circuit consisting of wires and gates. Then you can convert that to a satisfiability problem where you have a bunch of logical clauses. We covered these two steps in our previous video, which you can check out. And finally, it's not that hard to convert the satisfiability problem into graph coloring. So that's how you go all the way from Mario to graph coloring. After we put everything together, we can interpret breaking the Mario world record as the problem of being able to color a certain graph. Since the graph represents the whole Mario game, it's absolutely massive, but it is a concrete graph. So it's enough to prove to you that I can color it, and that's a problem for which we can already construct a zero-knowledge proof. This reduction trick is so general that, in theory, you can apply it to pretty much any problem you can think of, not just Sudoku or Mario. For example, if you ever hack the Linux kernel, resolve the Riemann hypothesis, or even beat Minesweeper on expert difficulty, you can convince the world about it without revealing how the hell you did it. Okay, this video is getting pretty crazy, so it's time to zoom out. We've seen a zero-knowledge proof of a very specific problem, namely graph coloring. However, the theory of NP-completeness tells us that graph coloring is so general that almost anything can be seen as specific instances of this one problem. So we end up with a very general zero-knowledge proof. I can convince somebody that I've solved the problem without giving away any knowledge of how I did it. And all this without any trusted authority. Let's zoom out even further. Ultimately, the fundamental question of cryptography is how do we deal with the lack of trust? For example, think of an everyday task like logging into a website. The reason websites require passwords is simply that we don't trust other people. However, most cryptographic solutions don't completely remove the trust problem. In our example, you still have to trust that the website itself is secure and not trying to do something fishy with your password. That's usually a correct assumption, but not always. What's so amazing about zero-knowledge proofs is that they don't require any trusted authority. Well, maybe except your compiler or something like that. That's why it was a shock when, in the 80s, researchers came up with the protocol that we saw in this video. But that was just the beginning. We now understand that, in a certain sense, any problem that can be solved with a trusted authority can also be solved without it. Another special case of this principle are cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. I know for many of you, cryptocurrencies are now a synonym for scams, but that was only until now. We're proud to announce the release of our new Polylog coin. Join the presale by smack. Anyway, I think it's good to understand that people who developed the first blockchain protocols were cryptographers who understood the immense promise of cryptography. In fact, advanced blockchain protocols are among the few examples of practical software that actually implement zero-knowledge proofs. And funnily enough, zero-knowledge proofs are used to speed up these protocols. I was quite surprised to learn that because the protocol that we showed in our video is quite computationally inefficient. But we're getting way beyond the scope of this video, so it's time to finish. If you want to know more, check out our blog post that covers some more advanced topics that we had to skip here. Also check out our recent videos because they're closely related to this one. And of course, like and subscribe. Bye! I know that for many of you, cryptocurrencies are now a synonym for scams. But that was only until now. We are proud to release our new Pololog coin. Join the pre-sale by smashing this button! <laughs> Pojď to zkusit ty, Ríšo, ať máme nějaký mím do Discordu.